In the last decade, a new threat has exploded onto the scene in the form of MRSA, methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, a relatively common bacteria with an uncommon capacity to outwit many antibiotics. In my experience, MRSA is a burrowing organism. It can stay on the skin for a period of time, then begins to burrow through skin layer after skin layer after skin layer until it gets down to to what it's after, down to the, the, the meat of which you're made. For the most part, uh, studies have shown for about 75 to 80 percent of the time, it's simply a, a skin or soft tissue lesion that can be treated and can go away fairly rapidly. But if it's uh, allowed to proceed unchecked, it can be catastrophic, uh, involving life, limb, or even death. Not only is MRSA aggressive within the body, it aggressively spreads through high-density, high-risk populations like sports teams, prisons, and healthcare facilities. Most healthcare providers who are, who are working with the public have seen an outbreak, but may or may not have recognized it. Skin-to-skin -skin contact is the primary means of contagion. The portal can be microscopic, and the source can be a human carrier who's colonized but not actively infected. They've done some uh, uh, interesting studies where, uh, you know, if you're a MRSA carrier, um, you not only have it in your, your nares, but you also have it on your hands as well. So anything you touch with your hands, whether it's a doorknob or, or something in the, uh, the locker room, you may be passing bacteria on to other people. Fomite is anything that can travel between you and I and carry organisms with it. Any item that touches me and then at a future point touches you can potentially serve as a fomite. It may be uh, something as simple as a, as a toothbrush, a razor, a towel. Uh, it can be a wrestling mat. I think wrestling and football are probably two of the highest risk sports uh, for a couple of reasons. One, because of body contact. I think the other thing is they're, they're large team sports, and many times they have a communal locker room where infection can be passed on from one person to another. Once a person is infected with MRSA, it can spread aggressively. In fact, that speed of progression is one of the differentiating features of this superbug. The CDC recommends six ways to prevent and control MRSA in a community setting. Increased recognition, appropriate treatment, wound care and containment, personal hygiene, exclusion from activities, and clean environment. The majority of MRSA cases that you're going to have in front of you are going to present as a simple boil, a very simple skin lesion, localized, and in my experience, usually to an extremity. When you look at uh, MRSA and spider bites, they look very similar. My position is very easy. There are no spider bites, none. It's all MRSA. And then you work backwards. And having somebody that can see a potential lesion, recognize that, know how to treat it, and most importantly, know how to refer it when appropriate to a physician is critical. The CDC strongly suggests that everyone involved be educated about the risks and about prevention. As the maker of Hibiclin's antimicrobial skin cleanser, we're doing our part, providing posters, literature, and DVDs like this, free to at-risk communities. In our particular setting, we culture virtually every wound we see. It's actually two reasons to do a culture, though. One reason is for the person that you have in front of you. What does this person have? The other reason is for the other individuals who are also in that environment. If we have any lesion that we think would need incision and drainage, um, we want to refer to, an eye, to a physician for that. And they may, may need antibiotic therapy as well, so we want to get them involved in that. When it comes to selecting an antibiotic in, in MRSA, yeah, there, there's, a, there, there's quite a spectrum. You can, on one end of the spectrum, have your basic standby, old workhorse antibiotics of Bactrim, doxycycline, rifampin. And on the other end, you've got some of your more expensive antibiotics, such as vancomycin, and you've got some of your newer, almost more exotic Ferrari-type antibiotics like Zyvox. What we found worked the best for us was to be very aggressive 
with the use of our skin decontamination procedures, the Hibby Cleanse. And that allowed us the luxury of starting with some of the, some of the more moderate antibiotics. We want to see our athletes every day with, with someone who has an infection or suspected infection and not only look at the lesion itself, but it has the potential to become systemic. So we want to make sure that they're not running a fever. What is their pulse? What is their blood pressure? We want to check them from a general medical standpoint as well as looking at their focal lesion. If you find yourself in a healthcare setting and in a position where someone in front of you has, a, has an abnormal vital sign uh, and there's even the remotest possibility of, of MRSA being involved, uh, that is something best handled by an emergency department. To help prevent MRSA from going systemic or spreading to others, early stage skin infections must be cleaned with an antimicrobial cleanser and dressed with a sterile nonstick bandage at least daily. Remember, MRSA lives on the skin. So some would argue that the majority the majority of your treatment needs to be addressed to the skin. One of the things we look at is skin color. We want to feel for skin warmth. Uh, obviously, warmth is a, a sign of infection. Another simple thing we do is look at what we call the air of induration or redness around the wound. And a simple thing we do is just take a, a Sharpie or a laundry pen and just make a series of dotted lines around that area. I can look at that the next morning when they come back in 12 hours later. And I can look and see if the induration inside or outside of that borders. And it gives me an objective way to know how the wound has changed. For every new wound you outline, use a new pen to prevent cross-contamination. I can take a, a digital photograph of that wound and attach it to an email and send it to my team physician along with our injury report, and it gives him a way to objectively look at the wound and compare it to when he last saw it. According to the CDC, preventive steps should be taken even if there are no visible wounds. So often, in high-risk environments, standard procedure calls for every wound to be flushed with a diluted antimicrobial and saline solution. One of the things we try to encourage with all of our athletes is, is personal hygiene. One of the biggest things is showering immediately after athletic activity. Every shower should be accompanied by your own soap, a clean towel, and clean clothes. Reusing a towel or clothing after a shower could simply contaminate you all over again. We really try to emphasize hand washing, and uh, we have a variety of different things. We have HIPAA cleanse by the sink that we can use. We also have alcohol-based dispensers put on the wall mounts at, at various places as well. We're talking about some really easy things to do here. We're talking about using a, a particular soap in a particular way that will protect the people for whom you carry a responsibility. Why would you not? We try to encourage our, our sports medicine staff anytime that they're uh, dealing with any type of wound or open lesion to make sure they have personal protective equipment as gloves. But also encourage them that anytime they have patient contact, they always wash their hands yeah, with hot water and soap before they proceed to the next patient. One of the reasons that we like to use HIPAA cleanse is because of the fact it has CHG in it and it has an extended period of time coverage. You can actually use HIPAA cleanse as a shield to keep the bacteria off of your body. Hibby Cleanse will, will, uh, will dry and not allow the bacteria to get a foothold. You can also use Hibby Cleanse to actually eradicate or, or destroy or kill any bacteria that did make it onto your skin. So what we try to do in our athletic venues, whether we're on the basketball court or the swimming pool deck or the football field, is have some type of waterless cleanser there, uh, whether it's a, a Hippostat, like a, a hand wash, uh, a wipe, uh, whether it's some type of uh, alcohol-based cleanser, but we want to have something there that's available to use on site where you may not necessarily have a sink and, and hot water and soap. You don't have to be so passive about this. You, you can take an active step, and if you're a person who is in certain high-risk environments, it's, it's almost irresponsible to not take an active step. Since MRSA is so contagious, wounds must be covered and physical contact limited until lesions heal. One of the, the biggest challenges I think we have with MRSA is determining when an athlete can return to play. Um, I think you have to look at it from a couple of different areas. First, from a medical standpoint, is it safe for the athlete to compete? Um, again, <clears throat> MRSA 
probably 75 to 80 percent of the time is simply a, a skin or soft tissue lesion. And in that situation, I think if you can protect the athlete and cover it well and also protect other participants, there's no problem with that at all. Um, one of the things I think you have to look at is the sport that they're in. Wrestling may be a little bit harder because they're getting more skin-to-skin -skin contact. I think another thing you have to look at is the location of the lesion. So if we have a, a lesion over a joint, we're probably a little bit more conservative. No matter how well we protect our skin, if we don't identify and eliminate all potential sources, we risk recontamination every day. You do need to destroy MRSA on surfaces. There's some very scary literature about how long it potentially can live on surfaces. In uh, several document studies, uh, particularly one in Connecticut, uh, whirlpools were linked as a direct source of contamination. We feel like our strength conditioning area is a high risk area. For example, if you have a large group working out and uh, one athlete gets off the leg press and another athlete immediately gets on, we want to make sure that that was clean before the next athlete gets on. One of our other concerns is carpet. Uh, we actually did some culture facilities and carpet was one of the areas that we identified at risk. Uh, the fibers are cloth and they can hold you know, bacterial infections in. Fibers on clothing can also carry MRSA, which is why all towels, workout wear, uniforms, and protective pads should be washed after every use in hot water, then dried completely with hot air. Likewise, all athletic equipment should be cleaned before or after use especially items like mats where physical contact takes place. Every one of those high-risk environments needs strategies, policies, procedures in place. They don't have to be five pages long. Matter of fact, the simpler that they are and the easier that they are to maintain, the more effective that they are. We have a hard surface cleaner that we use for our countertops and our tables, and we try to clean our tables, uh, being diligent to do it between every patient change. MRSA is not a, a real hard organism to kill. A 5% bleach solution seems to do just fine. Almost any of the commercially available preparations on the market will, will destroy MRSA on, uh, on surfaces. We really feel like our custodians are our first line of defense in preventing infection, and uh, we want them to understand one, how much of an important role they play, two, how much we appreciate them for doing that. There is no comparison between the costs of prevention and early treatment in MRSA compared to the cost of treating the more advanced stages of MRSA, particularly when you, when you factor into the equation that a, a certain number of, of people have died from MRSA. And that's, that's not something you can put a dollar amount on. If you're in a high-risk environment or a position of authority, you have to take MRSA seriously and join the fight to stop it. It can be done. If we recognize MRSA early, treat it properly, care for wounds conscientiously, and restrict contact until lesions heal, we're halfway there. If we also eliminate MRSA from our environments and from our bodies, we can contain or even eradicate this growing threat, saving time, money, and pain in the process. It's not a decision you really have to wrestle with. If you simply practice intervention and prevention, you stand the best chance of keeping yourself and everyone else on your team healthy and in the game.